I would like to just say a, a few words about uh, those of the two men that we're privileged to have with us tonight. Um, and I wish I, I had some more of uh, Chad's books to show, but uh, we've run out of some. And uh, uh, But I can tell you a couple of the, the books that, that he's done. But he uh, has, I don't know how long you've worked at the church history department, Chad, but how long have you? Uh, started in 87. So. Okay. Some might say too long, man. Yes. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, <laughs> Uh, he's he's been there practically ever since I can remember, and um, he has uh, he did a book that unfortunately I can't show you, uh, Joseph Smith's America, also forty ways to look at Brigham Young, uh, new approach to a remarkable man. Uh, however, fortunately we do have this particular book <laughs> in stock, um, which is a good thing when you're doing a signing on a given book. Um, and we were really excited to see the, the George Q. Cannon journals, well, I won't say back on track, but in the lineup again. Um, uh, it's been quite a number of years since uh, volume one of the George Q. Cannon journals came out. Um, and we're hoping that this is the second of many, and I'm hoping that they will, uh, one of them will comment on that, because if not, it's going to definitely come up in a Q&A as far as additional uh, George Q. Cannon journals. But if you've taken the time to look at that, it's a, it's a beautiful volume. Uh, and uh, it's more than one evening's reading, i found. Um, but we're excited to have, have this book out. Of course, uh, Richard E. Turley, Jr., I get it all right. Um, I've known Rick for many years, and uh, he is the assistant church historian, and uh, just, I know I don't say this to embarrass him, but uh, when he and Elder Jensen worked together in the church historical department, uh, I think we made enormous leaps and bounds in <clears throat> the opening up of uh, our history in getting publications going again, and um, with the Joseph Smith papers, uh, and Rick is the chairman of the, is it Board of Editors? Is that you? I'm a member of the editorial board. Med member of the editorial board, sorry. Uh, the Joseph Smith Papers Project, which, if you're not acquainted with the Joseph Smith Papers, you should be, because it's, in my opinion, one of the greatest accomplishments uh, in the church as far as history goes uh, in generations and uh, is an ongoing project that will enormously benefit um, us in the church and out of the church. And it's a, it's a series that is, um, is envied by uh, many that are producing their own sets of papers or have produced their own sets of papers of, of important individuals. Um, Rick has also, and we have some of these here, <clears throat> done uh, How We Got the Book of Mormon, How We Got the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, <clears throat> there are now, what, three volumes mm -hmm. of Women of Faith uh, done with uh, Brittany Chapman and um, with the uh, Bill Slaughter uh, is the co-author of the, those two books that I mentioned, uh, and those are really fun because they're they got lots of pictures. Um, but all the important editions, uh, kind of the landmark editions of the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants, and, and I'm serious of plenty of illustrations, but the the text is is very good. Um, anyway, uh, Rick is produced, and he's a very prolific guy. I asked him, I've asked him on more than one occasion, how he can possibly write so much and be such a busy guy. He, he has more meetings and is going more places than anybody I know, and he just says, I don't sleep. So that's one way to do it. <laughs> so um, I'm, it's my privilege to uh, now turn the time over to Chad Orton and Rick Turley, and thanks again for coming.
Did you turn that up? Oh, there we go. Oh. Thanks, Kurt, and uh, friends, aloha. Um, yeah. Um, the Canon Journals, uh, I think most of you are aware, are a, a publication sponsored by the, the Church History Department. Uh, this second volume, well, um, if I can show these. For a number of years, the Church History Department has had in its, uh, as part of its collection three journals kept by George Q. Cannon. Uh, one's a pocket <laughs> journal, the other two are, are a little bit bigger. They talk about his experiences going to California in 1849 and then recount his Hawaiian mission experiences uh, from 1850 to 1854. Uh, now all of these have appeared in, in print. The entire um, um, the entire journals have. Um, so just a little plug that those two actually uh, go together if you're not um, familiar. Um, and uh, the, the, his Hawaiian mission and his trip to California was easily one of the pivotal experiences of, of Canon's life. For those who, we all know that LDS missions tend to have a, a strong influence upon those who serve, but um, in, in some ways, Canon had more so than the average um, um, Latter-day Saint because it propelled him, I, I firmly believe it propelled him, into becoming uh, what he would later become, a, you know, a member of the uh, uh, First Presidency. He would serve as a counselor to four presidents. Uh, a five-time, I believe it's five-time, uh, delegate from the territory of uh, Utah. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the most prominent and interesting individuals of the 19th century. So, um, so in this we have published all of <coughs> Cannon's journals and in addition as we were talking earlier we have included quite a, a, a bit of supporting ma materials. Um, and you know when Rick first called me in and asked me to if I would be willing to publish these journals um, I, I still remember sitting there, and the first thoughts in my going through my mind was: first, I didn't know Cannon went on a mission to Hawaii. I had been a 20th century historian; that was where my area of expertise is, um, and so I was really kind of surprised. So I started out this fairly new. And the second thing I realized I didn't know is I didn't know anything about Hawaii. I didn't know the the first thing, so. Um, we had to start basically from the ground, you know, up with with this uh, with this project. And I remember sitting down reading the journal the first time, and they mentioned the New Uanu Valley. And this was actually we we started this a number of years ago. Um, went to an encyclopedia, a book to read about the New Uanu Valley, and discovered that that was where King Kamehameha the Great had won the final battle against the Oahu forces to unite Hawaii. And so in the first draft of this, of, of this, I talked down that the, uh, and why that's significant is that's where the, the LDS missionaries went to dedicate the land. And so I made a note that this is, they went near the area where Kamehameha won the battle and dedicated the, the, the what was then a country. Um, it was only after I went to Hawaii that I discovered and that was one of the compelling points Rick said to do this. He promised me a trip to Hawaii to do research. So, uh, so it was a tough life, but somebody had to do it. That I discovered valleys are not unlike valleys in um, Wales. Uh, you know, they're not here, this open area. They're, they're the long, would call them probably a, a canyon. And the missionaries dedicated the country on one side, and Kamehameha won the battle on the on the other side. So there were some some things that uh, we had to um, uh, we had to learn to start from the, the ground up on, on this project. Um, one of the things, and those who have done edited works uh, may uh, agree with me on, is that I think doing an edited volume in many ways is more difficult than doing a regular history. Um, because with an edited volume, the document itself determines how you go. And with a, when you're doing a regular history, uh, traditional history, 
if there's something you don't want to deal with, um, you you can kind of um, skip over it. It's um, it's um, uh, and so that is part of also what has dictated how this has gone. We have published, I think I said, the entire entire journal, uh, except for a very few words that uh, fell into the category of sacred, private, and confidential, um, in which we have, have uh, separated the individual from their, their sins. It's, it's simply, you know, uh, that, that simple. Um, and, and when I started to ask Rick, what do you want? Are we publishing here Canon's journal? Are we using Canon's journal to talk about Canon's mission? Or are we using the journal to give a history of the Hawaiian mission? He said, I think what we're doing here is doing a Canon's Hawaiian mission. So, and why I, I tell you that is, is oftentimes people look at the footnotes and it's, it's overwhelming, but there are a number of instances <coughs> where Canon will have say something about his day and there are other people who have said other things about his day, what he was doing that particular day. And so we have uh, uh, included a number of those uh, references so that, um, so it's, it's about his mission. So, um, and, and in a number of cases, it's, it's, it's wonderful because they add, in, in other cases, they add to what he has to say. I, you know, one of the entries I, I really like is, and I've, I've shared this elsewhere, is that uh, the missionaries, when they get to Hawaii, they notice that Hawaiians, well, they're different. They're not like those who are coming to Utah, and this was at a period of the gathering. <coughs> and, um, and, and so, what did they do with these individuals? There's also a question whether they could actually leave Hawaii. But once they got here, the fact that they dressed differently, they ate differently, they, they didn't sleep in beds, didn't use eating utensils, would they get along in Utah? And as they were talking about this, one of the missionaries has an experience where he speaks in tongues. And another one of the missionaries interprets it. And all Canon has to say is, Brother Woodbury spoke in tongues. But the other missionaries tell us what Brother Woodbury had to say. They all wrote down, and it was basically that Hawaiians were a, a chosen people of God. They were descended from a, um, ancient Israel, that they're... The, the missionaries have come and answered to their, their prayers of their ancestors. And the part that always jumped out at me is that they prophesied that there would be plurals, temples, plural, in Hawaii. Um, and at that time, there had been two temples built in the church. One at Kirtland, one at Nauvoo, and it would still be six months before they began work on the Salt Lake Temple. And here this missionary is saying that there would be temples, plural, um, I don't know why that didn't impress Canon, but, you know, whatever, he didn't write it down. But we see that today. There are now, uh, you know, two temples um, in, in the islands. Um, uh, let me just make sure. Uh, and, and so we have gone through, and we have gone through not only his journals, but all the missionaries that were there in the islands with him, and have written and have put a footnote where we felt it would add to what Cannon wrote or about um, Cannon's experience. Um, and in addition to that, we have included maps explaining everywhere where Cannon went, uh, correspondence where we could find letters that Cannon wrote, um, and we also have minutes. Uh, and some people are wondering why we have the minutes in there. Um, Canon notes in his journal that he was the one who created those minutes that were sent to Salt Lake that we have added. So that was part of his, his mission. And, and we've got a nice biographical register. Canon mentioned, I think it was 502 people in his journal. And we were able to find the information on a little over 300 of those. So um, part of the, the, and somebody was showing it up, the, the uh, part of the supporting material is is fairly quite uh, is extensive as well, and and I kind of like this approach from the point of view that.
Cannon is given so much credit for starting the church in Hawaii, and he was there. He was he was a leading figure. It would be pro, it was prophesied that his name would always be associated with the church in Hawaii. But there were other missionaries who didn't have the same gifts, who didn't have the same talents, who were there with with Hawaii, and by including some of uh, with Cannon in Hawaii, and by including some of this information, their footnotes. We we're also able to give kind of a, a, a tribute to these um, individuals as well, and and it helps explain, um, you know, some of the there are some inconsistencies in in dealing with the journals that I, I think were kind of fun that just showed how close these missionaries are. There's some periods where Cannon refers to himself in the third person. George C. Cannon did this today. And he's obviously copying from somebody else's journal uh, about what he was doing that particular day. Or we know in one case somebody else wrote it because it's in a different hand. And it was kind of fun to try to figure all these out. So um, anyway, Canon Mission Journal. I, I, of all the mission journals I have read, and I have to admit I have spent more time in this than any other one, I easily think that this may be the best mission journal we have, or if not the best, it's at least one uh, of the best. Um, because he was a good writer, first off. He knows how to tell a, a story. Um, and, and one of the things I like about it is that um, he, he's kind of an average person at the time. We know later on that he's a, 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 a prominent general authority, but at the time he's a nobody. When he gets to Hawaii, He's the last one to sh sign the ship's manifest, uh, the port, uh, because he's the youngest. He's one of the most least uh, um, significant of the individuals there. I mean, you have Henry Bigler, who by now is well known because of, um, you know, his uh, helping to uh, uh, discover there with the discovery of gold and. And Hiram Clark, who was the mission president, had served five missions prior to this time. And these were all fairly prominent individual. And Cannon's one claim to fame that he was um, John Taylor's nephew. But that really wasn't kind of um, helping in this. And, 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 and so there's some aspects of this that I like. Is he's a common person writing about experiences. Um, he, he has the same fears, concerns. As I read this, I thought, wow. In some ways, he's describing me as a missionary. You know, the, the concerns about getting down and dealing with the, a different culture than you're used to. Um, I, I served in the States, but I hear, you know, I have a daughter on a mission right now, and she talks about the struggles trying to learn the language. And, and these are things that Cannon are writing every day in his um, journal. Uh, one of the things I love is that he, he, had a, he left a girl. Uh, Elizabeth Hoagland. She waited for him for five years. And he writes in his journals, you know, why hasn't she written me? What's going on? You know, things that I think missionary, you know, he's wondering if he's been dear John. Things that missionaries today um, kind of deal with, they kind of relate to. And, and, and besides that, he's just so well read. Um, he knows how to put together a, a, a phrase. Um, you know, when he gets to Hawaii, uh, there's a harbor pilot that helps lead the ship in. And he describes him as the personification of John Bull. Well, you come to discover that John Bull in popular literature is a, um, a middle-aged, uh, paunchy, balding gentleman. Um, and so Cannon's describing this as what he has, has particularly uh, read. I... Um, I, there's, there's one entry in here that I, I really like, and I'll just read it to you, just to show what kind of a writer he is. It's like, and I'm going to have to put my glasses on. Um, this talks about his first experience um, preaching in Hawaiian. And so he goes through and gives a description that I think is fairly unique. He talks about that they just finished building a, a house, and he says, I had not a very crowded house, nor the congregation did not get a very eloquent sermon. 
And he, he talks elsewhere, and it's, it's not in here, that, that he startled himself when he first gave out the opening hymn because where he had practiced preaching, the acoustics are different than in this house. But this is the part I like. No prisoner under sentence of death dreaded the approach of the hour of execution more than I did the approach of the hour of this meeting. I, who had never attempted to speak before an assembly in my own mother tongue, but few times in my life, and now to preach in a foreign tongue, it made me nervous to think about it, and I almost felt to shrink from it. I knew nothing but the Spirit of the Lord could sustain me, and I felt to cry unto him to assist me in this my time of need, and he did assist me. I had done a great deal better than I could have expected, although it was weak. <laughs> and so, and, and that's another thing I, I really like about canon, is that, as a journal keeper, is he's frequently uh, writing introspective feelings about what is he doing. Uh, if I didn't have a good meeting today, is it me or was it the Hawaiians? Was there something wrong in, in my life? And I, In my own life, I don't know that I, I do that in my journals. I probably need to be doing some more of that. But um, one, one, one of the things about the... Uh, um, that I, I really like is that the Hawaiian mission, for those who are not familiar with it, I don't know if, are you guys familiar with the very beginning, it's, a, um, it's one of the great missionary stories in the church. It's not told as much as, as uh, the stories in England or other places, but it, it is absolutely unique. I don't know of another mission, and, and unique's overused, I, I recognize that as, as a term, but I don't know of another mission that had similar beginnings of the Hawaiian mission. It alternated regularly during the early days between inspired and ill-fated. It always seemed like it was going to implode and then something happens. And, um, and, and Canon, I mean, he, he deals with a number of crises. These are crises of expectation but not necessarily crises of faith. Um, he somehow is able to maintain his faith when other people don't. Um, and, 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 you know, one of the things I've, I've read and as I was doing research, there are a number of stories out there about the beginnings of the Hawaiian mission that would appear not to be um, correct, that the Times <coughs> Journal um, is now that it's published, that uh, some of this mis misinformation will be, uh, hopefully, will be changed by, by future um, historians as they, as they write about the experiences in, in Hawaii. Um, and they also tell some wonderful stories that, that Cannon's never shared elsewhere that I think are, are you know, absolutely fun. Um, people have often asked me, do I have a favorite journal entry? And I say, well, I, you know, I actually do. Um, in that um, Cannon gets to Hawaii and, uh, and he's shown a great deal of faith up, up to this point, but they're going to have a mission conference. And, um, and they pray for the Lord. It's during the rainy season, so they pray the Lord the night before that he will hold off the rain and they get up in time for a conference because they're going to hold it outdoors and it looks like it's going to rain. So they, he starts moving cleaning out a shed so that they can hold the conference in, to which uh, Jonathan Napella, his most famous convert, um, shows up and asks him, well, what are you doing? He said, well, it's going to rain, so we're going to move this indoors. And, and to which Napella says, well, that doesn't show a lot of faith, does it? <laughs> Here you pray the Lord that he'll hold off the rain, and at the first sign, um, it looks like it's going to rain, you move indoors. Well, you know, he talks about how that they held it outdoors. But later on, this faith that he develops there, you, you see it in other instances. Um, prior to this meeting, he needed a horse to travel across the islands. And he writes that he spent a good deal of time chasing the horse. After this, he, um, he's, uh, he, start, he needs a horse again, and he starts chasing it. And he says, wait a minute, what am I doing? If I'm supposed to have a horse, the Lord will provide me this horse. So he and his companion kneel down, and they uh, pray, and immediately the horse stops, and they walk over and get it. And his companion just writes in the most spectacular terms, what a, what a surprise this is 
that Cannon is able to pray the Lord to stop a, a wild horse from, from running. And, and so there's some experiences like that. Um, you know, they start out in the gold fields. Uh, they, they have, when, the, when we pick up this journal, the, Mike Landon to California in 49, gets him to California, and when Cannon starts writing again, he's in the gold fields. And it has been an awful time for all of those involved. They have made no money. Um, talk, you know, some of them talk about, you know, it's, we've had a year living out under the stars and the cold and the snow and the rain, and we want to go home. And, um, and at that point, Charles C. Rich shows up and calls them on a mission to Hawaii. That's the last place on this planet they want to go. They, they don't know it's going to be a vacation paradise someday. <laughs> they, I, they know absolutely nothing about Hawaii except for that it's in the opposite direction of where they want to go. And that is to go home. And besides, if they're going on a mission, how are they going to do it? They don't have preaching clothes. They don't have uh, money. Cannon doesn't have a Book of Mormon with him. He's never preached a sermon. But, um, and, and besides that, the day that Rich arrives, their, their wing dam has been destroyed, and there's no way that they can mine, the, mine, the, uh, um, mine their claim. And most of those leave the river, the newspapers tell us that, and Cannon and his companions try it again, and they strike gold. And they not only strike gold, they strike it rich. Um, but then as quickly as the, the claim comes, um, uh, you know, it came, the gold stopped. And as when they got through and figured it out, they had enough money to send back to their uh, pay off their debts in Utah, pay their debts, pay their way to Hawaii, and get close. Um, and you know, later on he'd tell somebody, well, don't don't be discouraged when things don't look bright till the end. We didn't think we'd get money to go to Hawaii and, and, and look what happened. Um, here, um, uh, you know, all the way along, there are just experiences. They thought they were going to Hawaii to preach to whites. They thought that's who lived in Hawaii, and came to discover that Hawaiians spoke Hawaiian, and that if they are going to be staying there to serve a mission, it may not be just the winter that they initially anticipated that that they were going to uh, um, go and. And, and so, what do you do um, when, when these expectations don't arise? There were five of the missionaries who went home. In fact, the mission president wanted to close the mission because he said, we're not going to do any good here. Um, but Cannon um, stuck, it, stuck it out, he and, and four other uh, individuals, and it turned out to be one of the most successful of the 19th century missions. Even though Cannon was told, you're going to find a people prepared, it didn't happen overnight. Um, uh, you know, he, he went on one, his first preaching journey. He said, I'm going to go find some people who know about, the Lord has told me that I would find. And he does. But it takes him ten months later before they are baptized. I mean, now we live in this kind of McDonald society. It's got to be an instant uh, success. But he had to persevere and deal with some of these issues that um, that so many of us had to uh, uh, to deal with, uh, you know. And as I said, he, he writes down some of his uh, feelings. You 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 watch him grow. Um, you know, at the first meeting that they preached there, Cannon writes down Henry Bigler spoke, and Henry Bigler writes in his journal. Well, Cannon told me since I was the oldest, I had to speak. Because he didn't want to speak. And so you see these things um, growing. And, and, it's, and that's what's fun about a, this journal, why I think it's so great, is you watch canon grow before your eyes. From someone who doesn't, can't speak, or doesn't want to speak, till people are calling him, come preach to us, and he goes around the islands and, and preaches... Um, uh, you know, and and you know, but he was still human. There, he had the difficulties to deal with. So you have these these great uh, experiences, 
And you also have some of this honesty. I forgot to mention that he doesn't write Hawaiian all that often in his journal. But there's one case where he notes where he gets a letter from the, uh, from the mission president on Oahu and Canons on Maui saying that he would, that they thought it would be a great idea if he stayed on the, in Hawaii and published the Book of Mormon. And after writing that, Canon writes some Hawaiian. And, and so we had this translated, and a nice way to say it is, um, he didn't share their feelings. He wrote down, uh, it's, it's a polite refusal. Perhaps not. I've been away from home for, and that was when he had only been away from home for four years, and he would still uh, have another year before, um, before, that, uh, um, uh, before he had returned home. Um, you know, some of the things I, I've learned to really appreciate George Buchanan is some of the things, not only what he wrote, but some of the things that he didn't write. Um, he'd become one of the leading figures in Hawaii, but, you know, it didn't let him go to his head. Uh, probably one of my, another favorite entry I have is he simply wrote that um, James Keeler needed a pair of shoes, and Keeler had been filling in for canon while he translated the Book of Mormon. And, and that's all he writes. But one of the other, two of the other missionaries tell us how Keeler got a pair of shoes. And it was Cannon who arranged for Keeler to get the shoes. But he didn't, you know, it was, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Um, so he, it's, it's a great story of mission. It's a great individual. Uh, as you watch him grow and you see him write, the, there are several pages in there that I just call the Psalms of George as he writes his feelings about experiences and, um, and and there are other things. He talks about how he you know when he first met the missionaries all his life he thought it would be great to go on a mission that's why he got there and he said now I realize how hard it is. <laughs> I don't know why I wanted so badly to be a missionary because this is this is really hard but you know he knew the Lord would help him but um, one of the other things that makes, I think, this journal so great is Canon is a great chronology, um, chronicler of what he sees. It's not just a missionary journal, and I think one of the underutilized records in the, in the world is Mormon mission journals as sources of local history. And Canon writes about, I, I was shocked as we were editing this, the wide variety of things that he would um, uh, write about. Um, you know, he described a riverboat trip down the American River. He, uh, um, gold fields. He attended the California Statehood Celebration. He wrote about all the events and gave his view of the uh, principal uh, speaker. And he arrived in Hawaii in the midst of what was literally a century of, of change. Um, he writes about food. He ate he ate their local food. He ate dog. He ate donkey. Poi reminded him initially of, of uh, printer's paste. He was a printer, and, um, and that, was, that was a struggle for him. And he hated Poi until he got to sent to one area where all they had were potatoes, but they didn't have salt or butter to put on them. And then he started talking about how wonderful uh, the Poi was. So he's telling us about some of the... the this local areas, how they live. He, he talks about their houses. He gives goes through several pages explaining if you want to know how to build a grass hut, he goes through great detail on how to do that. What, what layers that uh, you put on there. Um, one, one of the things is that uh, we have this book called Sites of, of Maui where Cannon served and so I was always comparing things and what was interesting is Cannon describes several villages that he visits and describes him that never made this book, the, the sites of Maui. So he's describing villages that existed in the past that are, are no longer um, there. Uh, you know, he talks about uh, you know things I didn't you know, I didn't know much about Hawaii, but uh, Hawaii at one time the Russians tried to occupy Hawaii. He visits the fort and he gives a description of the fort. He, Tells us about the number of cannons that are there. And maybe his name caused him to be interested in this. I don't know. And the conditions. Um, 
I didn't know that there was a Pacific element to the Crimea War. But Cannon talks about a joint British-French armada looking for Russians that pulls into um, Honolulu. Uh, there's a devastating smallpox epidemic that he, he talks about the meetings the government is, uh, is holding to deal with this. Um, sadly, there was a murder. He, he describes in great detail, he, uh, I guess, youthful curiosity, he goes and, 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 and sees the victim and describes the victim in great detail. He also follows this, the trial, and Cannon for a while served as um, interpreter for the, uh, the local judge. Um, naturally, there was a religious conflict going on. He has quite a bit to say about the local uh, Catholic fathers and the local Protestant uh, uh, Congregationalist ministers. And as you might um, und view, uh, understand, he didn't have very f very good to say about these uh, individuals, if we might put that uh, that way. And and uh, I've read some of their letters, and they didn't have a lot of good to say about the Mormons either. So it was kind of a... Um, uh, he, he spends a long time discussion on Cretan, Cretanism, because he read that in a newspaper, um, wanted to that. Uh, he talks about Utah Vance, um, and, uh, and, and it's really kind of interesting to see the world as, as, as he saw it. Uh, he visited, he met with uh, uh, four of the uh, five principal members of the Kamehameha royal family, as well as other local leaders, and so that is kind of fun to see him talk about all these, uh, um, uh, what is going on in Hawaii and giving a view that is fairly uh, unique. He describes infrastructure. He talks about one road traveling it and then coming back a year later and what the government has done to that road. So it's, it's more than just, you know, every day we got up and, 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 and proselyte. He's giving a wide variety of, of so many different um, uh, topics that it is really quite, uh, you know, it, it's really quite an amazing uh, work. I don't know what uh, what we're looking at as far as time. Yeah. Good. All right, so I just wanted to give you a, a brief overview. I, I, I tried to do this different a couple, a couple months ago. I gave... Uh, a, uh, a, a presentation on the beginnings of the Hawaiian mission focus. So I just, this time I thought it would be um, nice to give you just kind of a little view of, of the journals themselves, what's in them, um, and um, kind of understand what, what we've been doing with that. So with that overview, I don't know if there are any questions or I need, maybe you need to turn it to Rick for a rebuttal at this moment. <laughs> I thought I'd just say something about the future of the George Q. Cannon <coughs> Journals project. George, George Q. Cannon kept a journal from the first one that we published here until nearly his death in 1901. They're a spectacular set of journals, extraordinarily detailed. I think George Q. Cannon was one of the finest journalists of the 19th century in the church. And we've long felt that these journals need to be out and available to the public, and so we are committed to getting them out. The question of the form of publication is currently being discussed at the Church History Department right now. We have most of the journals transcribed. The standard for documentary editing is to have three what we call text verifications. We have an initial transcription that occurs, and of course with all transcriptions of that length you're going to have some errors. Then we have a second text verification that goes through, and then we have a third one against the originals. And so we're in the process right now of completing the third text verification for the entire set of journals. The gap between the first set that we published and today is about 15 years. And if you calculate how long it would take us if we maintain that kind of gap, it would go on for hundreds of years. So we're debating the possibility of not putting into them the kind of annotations that have been added for this set, but possibly just taking the transcriptions and putting them online. 
well, that's not a decision yet, but that's a, it's a matter of discussion as a way of getting those journals out so they can be available to interested parties. So that's the current state of the journals. That's about all I had to say. Why don't we have questions? In the back there? Will this publication be online? Uh, not initially, but ultimately uh, we hope to have all the journals online. Gary? Chad, does, does Canon, first of all, when, when does it start and how old is Canon? Um, good question. This particular journal starts in September of uh, 1850. Mm -hmm. uh, Canon at the time is 23 years old. Um, and it continues. The last entry is in October of 1854. Uh, so he's, he's 27 years old. He's on his way home from his mission. He stops writing around San Bernardino. And, but we do include an epilogue that gets him home. Uh, and then an epilogue that talks about his experiences in, um, in San Francisco just with the uh, uh, printing of the, the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. he, he wrote several times, I didn't think my mission would be complete if I didn't tell the story of the printing of the Book of Mormon. Um, he said that on a couple of other occasions, so uh, we also adopted that, you know, that experience as well. How would you describe, is, is he, does he write every day? Are there uh, reminiscent uh, entries? There are, he does, he's got a journal entry for almost mm -hmm. every day. But it's very clear in a number of instances where he, he has written these retrospectively, that he will sit down um, and say, I spent the day writing up my journal. And, and part of we know that some of this is that there are a few instances where he notes that he sent a letter on this day, and it's actually the day after the person who received the letter noted in his journal that he received it. So there are some things that obviously uh, um, uh, it, it appears that he's writing retrospectively and he has a few days that, you know, that are fairly different. And he borrows from other missionaries what they have to say. He, he, um, he copies from, from them or they copy from him and, and so. Rick, I'd like to hear a little bit about Adrian Cannon's work in getting access to the journals originally and then sure. what he did with them. Adrian W. Cannon was a grandson of George Q. Cannon who had a fascination with his grandfather and wanted to write a biography. So during the era of George Albert Smith in the 1940s, he approached the First Presidency, which had possession of the journals, and asked for permission to access them, which George Albert Smith, as church president, granted to him. He went back episodically and renewed that permission to see the journals. And when I was first in the Church History Department in 1986, shortly after that, he started coming in and talking with me about the journals and about his desire not only to publish a biography, but if possible to take the notes that he had written up, which were not complete transcriptions, but the more he studied the journals, the longer his notes became. And he, he liked this idea of taking them and publishing them as a set of George Q. Cannon journals. About that you know, not long after that, he got cancer and was trying to figure out well, what's going to happen to this project. And so we decided as a, as a department to take the project over. So Adrian Cannon's name is on the front of the book, even though he passed away before the first volume was published. We're going to maintain it there to recognize the decades of work that he put into trying to get George Q. Cannon's journals before the public. I don't want to monopolize the, the question time, but I do have a lot of questions. Sure. Because because this is an interesting the idea of uh, taking a document and then preparing it for other people to read is, is interesting to me. Uh, Chad, when you were working on identifying people, you said that there were like 500 plus people. Did you want to try to identify everybody, or just the ones that seemed important to the diary? We were our goal was to try to identify everyone if we could add additional information about them. Um, and, and so some of these, um, so it wasn't just the important, because part of these, uh, as we're going through other people's journal, we'd occasionally stumble across the name, and then we'd add that, that somebody might not know about these individuals. Um, some of the people like Brigham Young, other people are well known, but this may be the only opportunity that some of these these pioneers in, in Hawaii 
would have a chance to be recognized and people could learn about them. Um, and it's, it's proven, uh, you know, great uh, success. I, uh, uh, I, we include some, a photograph in there of one individual and I had uh, one of his descendants call and say, I've never seen this, this photograph before. I didn't know this information about my, my ancestor. So that's a part of what we were hoping to do. And most of these that we couldn't identify are just, uh, were, sadly, were Hawaiians. But we were able to add quite a bit of information in a biographical register about these, um, these individuals, that hoping that others will have the same experience. Part, part of the difficulty is that um, is frequently the Hawaiians only go by one name. You know, he, we know him as Napella, but his name's Jonathan Napella. Um, so when you'd have just one name, you're, you're certainly not certain whether it's a last name, a first name, whatever. So there were some difficulties in, in doing this. And sometimes that's all we could identify was that one individual. That's a good question. How long have you been on this project specifically? Uh, well, if you count stop and start time, <laughs> uh, we... Um, we started, I think it was, I hate to say this, it was like the fall of, I want to say 86? No, 96. 96. 96. Um, and we started doing this, and I had other assignments as well, so this is as the opportunity permitted. And in, 2000 and, and, uh, in 2002, we moved on. Uh, there was another, I got called to uh, do another another project, um, help with another project, and, and that is uh, Massacre at Mountain Meadows. So that sat for a number of years, and then we, and when we finally got back into it, I had been away from it so long, I basically had to start mm -hmm. over again learning all this, this information. And uh, it was about a year and a half ago that we turned the manuscript into Deseret Book, and so it sat there for, for a long time. So start and stop, uh, uh, it's been longer, you know, I, my hair was a different color <laughs> <laughs> when we started this project, yeah. How about the uh, contrast between Joseph F. Smith's time period and the Sandwich Islands? Is this in the same um, mission? That, that's Has a great question. Is this Joseph S. Smith and, and George <clears throat> Buchanan? George Q. Cannon uh, passes Joseph F. Smith in San Francisco. When he's on his way to Hawaii, George Q. Cannon is, is coming home. Um, he only briefly makes note. He'd gotten word that the, uh, the nephew of the prophet had been called on a mission, but that's all he has to say. So um, by that time, you know, the, the mission was, uh, you know, four years old, but, you know, Joseph F. was, was still there at, at the beginning. How good was his Hawaiian, you know, and, and the translation of the Book of Mormon for your future? I, I can't speak on the translation of, you know, of the Book of Mormon, um, that, but other, well, and I included an entry, other people said, well, you're almost as good as George with your Hawaiian. And that was one of the great compliments that they gave, that he was a fairly good speaker in Hawaiian. Um, so if there was anybody who could translate the, the Book of Mormon into Hawaiian, he was a, he was a fairly good one. So. He also had assistance from Jonathan Napella and others, others who went over what he did to make certain that it, it read properly. Yeah, and so he, after he went through, he started out with Jonathan Napella, then he spent a good deal of time with with William Fair and a uh, fellow, um, Kauai, fellow's name, going through it. He found the best of the, the speakers that he could find to try to do that. Uh, I've never talked to anyone who's read the Book of Mormon in Hawaiian, so I don't know how, <laughs> how, how good it is. So it'd be really interesting to find out. So that's a great question. What was the size of the church from beginning to end? Can you just get that a little bit? When the, when the church, uh, you know, uh, by the time they finished their mission, the church membership in the islands was about 4,000, was just a little over 4,000. 
And to give you uh, uh, some type of idea what that was like, the total population of Hawaii was just a little over 80,000. So it was about 5% of the, uh, the islands, islanders, or those in the island, were members of the church at that particular time, which is a far cry from when the mission president said, you know, in early 1851, we can't do anything here. There's nobody that's going to join the church here. And it proved <laughs> different. So. Uh, you, you mentioned this experience with the uh, speaking in tongues, uh, prophecy about the temples. W were there other similar experiences, uh, spiritual experiences, like their healings, visions, prophecies, other types of things you mentioned? There were. Um, there there are a number of these individuals who have had, had dreams. Uh, one of them talked about uh, um, seeing Canon coming forward, uh, saw him in a dream, coming to him with a book of scripture in his hands. And a number of people were, were talking about these. Canon had a number of dreams that he reported. There were a number of healings. I, 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 I should take it. One of my other favorite entries in his journal is that he writes this, and I think this is a direct quote. He said, I forgot to mention, and it's this I forgot to mention, that thy man I blessed last week to get his sight back is now seen. And this individual had been blind for 30 years. And he forgets to mention that type of an experience. Um, you know, th there was a situation where the missionaries are called one night to deliver a baby because the doctor is there can't do this and so they want the elders to come and perform a miracle and deliver this baby and canon it's a great entry talks about you know i don't know a thing about delivering babies i don't know what to do um, but he talks about you know the prayer that he and his offer and how you know rather than the mother dying and the baby dying like the doctor that the baby was delivered um, healthy, the mom lived. Uh, one of the the one of the footnotes there is one of those missionaries who assisted there. He wrote something to the effect that um, uh, I don't know what the doctors thought about us being midwives <laughs> and successful at delivering a baby, nor do I care. You know, because <laughs> he said everybody else says this is the Lord except for the doctor, and so. Yeah, the, the, there's a number of these experiences. There's, there's a chapter, I think it's in called, I'd rather have these feelings, not, I'd rather have these feelings in all the world. Because there was a period of time where it was almost like a Kirtland experience, where these were ha happening on a regular basis, where they talk about individuals being raised from the dead and other miraculous, uh, miraculous healings of, of that.